It is an honor indeed to be here as a re representative of the 7,500 women who served in Vietnam. 82% of those were nurses. And I can tell you that in that war, as in every war, the nurses never got the credit and the honor that they should have received. And seven of them lost their lives, and their names were on the wall. I received my word that I would be going to Vietnam in 1968 as I was finishing getting my master's degree at the University of Alabama. You know, that's that southern school down there. <laughs> <clears throat> and my first thought was, because when I went through training, they didn't train us anything about weapons, anything about combat. And I thought, if I'm going over that combat zone, I need to know how to use a weapon. So I immediately called and said, do I need to be weapons qualified? And they said, no, no, you don't need to be weapons qualified. <laughs> I thought, I don't agree with that. So I went home and I got my brother-in-law to teach me how to fire a rifle and a handgun. And then I went back to the Air Force and I qualified as an expert marksman. He did a good job of teaching me. So when you think of the women serving today in the combat suits they wore, my combat suit was a skirt and a blouse, and that's what I wore. I, I was assigned to McPhee headquarters. I lived in a hotel downtown. The nearest I came to action was when the Viet Cong rocketed the Central Market, which was about a block and a half from where I live, and another time when they fired at the embassy when I happened to be walking along the street about two blocks away. That was the closest I came to action. We worked every day, uh, 12 hours a day most days, except on Sunday afternoon we had an afternoon off. So that was my service in Vietnam. And I remember talking to a and a fellow army friend who was stationed at uh, Long Bend, and she went about that same time. And uh, her protection was, that she said, and she was an MP, was that she had her purse and she could swing it like that, you know, as somebody attacked her. That's a far cry from the way things are today. So as we think about changes, as, they re, as we think, and I think we need to think about changes, as we think about the changing role of women in the military today. If you go back to when women were first authorized, and they were nurses, to be in the military in 1901, they weren't given any rank because our members of Congress thought that women should not be ordering men around. Women have been ordering men around forever. <laughs> Now, things had changed by the time I came in the service. We did have rank. And uh, they had changed in 1948 so that we were full-fledged members of the military as opposed to just being in the reserve, as had been true in World War I and II. We didn't serve in combat. We were forbidden by law from serving there. We mostly either served in the medical area or in the uh, administration area. Uh, we, uh, there were various rules about whether we could serve and be married, and there certainly was one very cl clear rule. If you got pregnant, you were immediately discharged. And uh, we didn't get the same benefits as men. If you got married, your husband didn't get an ID card, couldn't go to the commissary, the BX, or get medical care. You couldn't get basic housing. I guess we weren't authorized to have husbands. <laughs> or if they had wanted us to have one, they would have given us one with an <laughs> ID card. <laughs> 
They never gave me one. <laughs> and then there was discrimination. You know, you didn't get considered for some jobs because they didn't think either that a woman could do it uh, or that um, we would be accepted as being the leaders in that. I can remember one time uh, some years ago when the Secretary of the Air Force was having a discussion about who was to head the uh, Air Force uh, Academy, and they concluded that no, that wasn't an appropriate job for a woman. Today, we've had one, and she's done okay. And there was harassment of various kinds, of which there's a little bit yet today. We didn't, and if we got out, we didn't get, the VA didn't treat us quite the same as it did men. They didn't have doctors in most VAs to take care of, you know, those problems that women have that men don't have. <laughs> now, we have found out recently that, you know, in the case of menopause, it not only applies to women, it applies to men. <laughs> so if your husband is asking kind of funny, look out. It may be menopause. And, and women didn't get the same benefits as men until 1973 in the Supreme Court as a result of action taken forward by attorney, um, the one who uh, goes on and on. <laughs> what name? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> there is somebody here who knows. And she is responsible for the taking that before the court and getting that ruling. But it's different today. We do get the benefits that women as veterans should get and spouses as well. So when you think about the news that was out just recently about the two women who went through ranger training, and when you think about the news that came in uh, almost daily through the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and you heard what women were doing there in the terms of combat. It's no wonder that Secretary of, of Defense Leon Panetta decided that they needed to remove that restriction on most specialties, or on so many specialties that said women could not be assigned to those. <clears throat> now that's still being resolved. And although these two women uh, got their ranger uh, badge, uh, that there isn't anything that says they're going to be assigned as a ranger. But they did it, and they said, and I talked to one the other day, that all the time she was going through training, she thought, I have got to do this so that other women will have an opportunity to do these kind of things. So it's a changed world for women today. So as I think about the memorial, I was asked, you know, what was the most difficult thing about doing the memorial? Let me tell you, the most difficult thing was the fundraising. It is hard to raise money. And it's hard to raise money to get something built, but it's even harder to raise money to keep it in operation and do the maintenance you have to do. So it's a continuing battle, and I've been at it now. That soon it will be my 30th year. So if you haven't visited the Women's Memorial at the main gate at Arlington National Cemetery, I hope you'll do that, and I hope you'll support us, because this is where we pay tribute to those women who served in Vietnam, in World War I, in World War II, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan, and everywhere they serve. And we do have a special exhibit for Vietnam, as well as Korea. So come and visit. And if you're a woman veteran, or you know a woman veteran, make sure she's registered, because we honor them individually. We have honored some 258,000 so far. But that's out of 3 million women. So we have a lot of work to do. 
So all you fellow Vietnam vets, help me find these women out there and get them registered. You know, my um, greatest memory of Vietnam, the one I will carry to my grave, was about a family that lived on the street, one of the refugees, about a block and a half away. And during the year I was there, the wife had a baby. They had a couple of other children and all their worldly possessions were around them there in the street. I wonder what happened to them, and I shall wonder to my dying day. There were so many things, so many children in orphanages, and our soldiers were so good about going and working in the orphanages with the children and we can be proud of them for what they did there and for all that they did. But when you think about the Vietnam War, say thanks to the nurses. Thank you.